stay tuned because for the next 60 minutes, Motorsports Unlimited is on the air. Hi, I'm Jerry Bryant, and these are the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And all this hour, we're going to have 60 minutes of action-packed excitement. All kinds of exciting things will happen. And we got the famous Bill Wilt, and we got all kinds of other good stuff that's happening all this hour. Motorsports Unlimited, 60 minutes of nonstop action. So let's go to the studio right now, huh? Thanks, Jerry, and hi, everybody. Welcome to the studio headquarters of Chicagoland's most watched, most talked about access television series. I'm Bill Wilt, and this is the 1,414th edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Today, we're returning to our effort to explain the origin and purpose of Motorsports Unlimited. Not that we ever left it, but I know it's confusing trying to follow the battle to protect public access cable television while at the same time understanding my effort to save motorsport. But life isn't always easy, and very few things have a single explanation. So please bear with me, and I'll try to sort it out. One thing I do want to correct. I identified Walt Modelski's Formula Atlantic car as Motorsports Unlimited's first show. And it's true. Shooting the program about Walt's car was our first effort to produce a program, but it wasn't the first episode of Motorsports Unlimited. The first episode, or should I say the first two episodes, it was a two-part series, was actually titled, Can Motorsports Survive? Part 1, and of course the second was Part 2. While I was going through the public access classes, I was invited by the Chicagoland Sports Car Club to share my views about the future of motorsport. As I recall, Walt Modelski was a member of the Chicagoland Sports Car Club and arranged for me to address their members. At the time, my sister's son was taking classes in video production at Columbia and offered to tape my presentation. As I recall, he shot it with a consumer VHS camcorder and gave me the raw footage to create a program as soon as I learned how to edit. As I think about it, it seems to me Walt Modelski is the one who came up with the name Motorsports Unlimited. We'd talked about it a number of times. We were pretty good friends, and he knew I wanted a name for the show that would include all kinds of motorsport. Cars, motorcycles, boats, snowmobiles, aircraft, everything. As I was completing the public access classes and starting to edit the presentation at the Chicagoland Sports Car Club, as well as starting production on the show about Walt's Formula Atlantic effort, I needed a title. I'm pretty sure Walt said, how about Motorsports Unlimited? I haven't seen him in many years, and I think he was older than me, so it's possible he might not be around anymore. Still, I want to give credit where credit is due. Motorsports Unlimited sounded pretty good to me and was all-inclusive. And I had to put a title on the paperwork for the shows on which I was working. Of course, it was easier to edit the Chicagoland Sports Car Club shows because they were already shot for me. All I had to do was put the material together in arable form including a series title, and it was done. So, Walt's series title suggestion was it, Motorsports Unlimited. Anyway, I wanted to correct that small point about what was the first episode of Motorsports Unlimited before I got on with it. I also want to say, for those of you still watching on a regular basis, I gave you a lot to think about on the last episode, and I do want you to think about it. If I'd had my druthers, I would have liked to feed those lines of thought to you a little at a time. But as I alluded to on the last episode, I feel a sense of urgency. You know, like the time to squander time is gone. I'm 74 years old and the idea of slowly persuading you is behind me. Based on the progress in the last 30 years, I won't last long enough to ease you into this. Hopefully you taped it for further review, but don't worry, if you haven't, and you think it's important, when I get done with this explanation series within Motorsports Unlimited, I'm going to re-air everything without the interruption of the rock shows and the lengthy time periods between explanation episodes caused by my physical lack of ability to complete them rapidly. Hopefully, airing the episodes together will make the material a little easier to follow. Okay. If I remember correctly, I stopped talking about the development of Motorsports Unlimited when the Continental Cablevision employee in Westmont insulted my guest and I felt I'd had enough of this dreadful public access operation at Westmont. The conclusion of the following year-long battle with Continental Cablevision resulted in me agreeing to produce Motorsports Unlimited at the Continental Cablevision Elmhurst facility instead of Westmont. It wasn't exactly smooth sailing there either, but fortunately the man running access for Continental Cablevision in Elmhurst knew his stuff 
and was good to his word. It seems to me his name was Joe Willoughby, and he made sure any unnecessary obstacles I encountered were quickly dealt with. The agreement worked well, and I was producing programs. Oh, <laughs> I should add, my elderly mother with failing health lived in Chicago, and during this period I was spending more time in Chicago than Franklin Park. Thus, I discovered Chicago Access Corporation. The suburbs got cable a couple of years before Chicago, so I was already producing programming when I made this discovery. It turned out that the Chicago arrangement was totally different than the suburbs. In the suburbs, one dealt directly with the cable company. You used their facilities and their equipment just as their own employees did. In Chicago, you didn't have any contact with the cable operators. The cable companies, who were the successful bidders for providing cable in various segments of Chicago, were required to provide funding for Chicago Access Corporation, or CAC. CAC then used the money to build an access studio and purchase portable equipment used only by access participants. The reality of this meant the Chicago Access participants had access to better equipment and a better studio. This might not sound like a big deal today because average consumer equipment produces beautiful pictures and excellent sound quality. That was not the case 30 years ago. Equipment trouble was a huge problem in the early days. The equipment was large, heavy, and bulky, not to mention unreliable, and produced barely acceptable video and audio quality. CAC, being brand new, had brand new state-of-the-art cable level equipment purchased for access participants only. The reality in the suburbs was the cable companies often provided equipment they knew was problematic because their own employees were having trouble with it. These items quickly became access equipment. At least in Chicago, one had a better chance of having workable equipment. This was not a small problem, and it became evident to me that the only way to fix the problem and make sure I had good working equipment when I went out to produce a program was to acquire my own equipment. The problem was, this stuff was expensive back then. Today, for a few hundred dollars, one can buy a new video camera and start shooting excellent pictures. 30 years ago, a new cable industry standard three-quarter inch Sony camera cost $16,000. This did not include a recording deck. This was before commercial camcorders. A recording deck would set you back another $4,000. Actually, I want to take a minute to talk about this because it was always a bone of contention with me. Typically, the cable company contracts called for the cable companies to provide state-of-the-art equipment for access participants. But what did this mean? A state-of-the-art network television camera sold for about $80,000 a far cry from the $16,000 cable company's state-of-the-art camera. So, why didn't the cable companies provide the $80,000 cameras? My argument was, if we are to compete in the marketplace of ideas dominated by network television, our program must look as good as network programming, or we would forever be considered second or even third rate. If our material looked like home movies compared to network television offerings, we would never be taken seriously. The cable companies seem to be determined to establish a different standard for cable shows as the standard for network television. While the networks used $80,000 beta cams and one-inch studio recording equipment, the cable industry was satisfied with a three-quarter inch standard. This wasn't acceptable to me, as my argument was essentially with the network television and the motorsport community's omission. Acceptable or not, I was stuck with it. Few people were TV savvy enough to know the difference, and I was having enough trouble getting good, working, serviceable three-quarter inch stuff. Network quality equipment was a long way off, and I wanted to get started right away. I didn't feel there was any time to lose, so I soldiered on. Not particularly happy about it, but some fights are better left to another day. First, I had to learn how to use this stuff. Then, we'll see. The studio in Chicago was much bigger than the Continental Cablevision studio in Elmhurst. This provided me with an excellent opportunity to bring in real motorsport stuff. You know, complete race cars, motorcycles, even aircraft. And I did it. After a few years, I'd learned enough about television production to produce a new show every week, 52 weeks a year. It wasn't easy, but somehow, between Continental Cablevision in Elmhurst and Chicago Access Corporation in Chicago, I had access to enough equipment and studio time and editing time to produce at this rate. I really felt a new show every week was an important way to compete with network television. Again, I wasn't competing with cable television or other access participants. My quarrel was with network television. They were killing us by omission, and I just had to get the motorsport community on television in a noticeable and continuous way, or I knew we would be gone. 
something I could not accept. As the years went by, I felt it was working. At the very least, I'd taught the public the word motorsport. Doesn't sound like a big deal now, I know, but it was a big deal then, and I felt the first step towards public acceptance of our community. It was working, but it was slow, but it was working. I could feel it. Actually, it was more than a feeling. I had tangible evidence that our Motorsports Unlimited efforts were producing results. First, everywhere I traveled, people were stopping me in the streets and stores and everywhere people could be found. You're that guy with the show with the girls with the feathers. I couldn't have been more pleased. It was working. People were watching. Of course, while I was pleased people were watching, it bothered me that people were recognizing me because of my television efforts instead of my achievements in motorsports. <laughs> you know, I'd probably better explain that. Our community is so used to being ignored, we hardly know when we're being insulted. Since I was 12 years old, and perhaps before that, I've been involved in motorsports one way or another. Our regular viewers already know that I believe I invented slot cars and slot car racing back in 1956. If you haven't heard the story, it's too long for this piece, and I'm sure I'll go through it again at another time. Right now, I want to talk about 1972 and Santa Fe Speedway. For those who don't know, Santa Fe Speedway was a dirt track located in the Chicago suburb of Willow Springs, southwest of Chicago. The track opened in 1953, although the park, Santa Fe Park, had been operating since the late 1800s. It was called Santa Fe Park because it was located on the Santa Fe Rail Line and people would come from Chicago by train to spend the day at Santa Fe Park. Now, I say it was located in Willow Springs, some are still arguing about the location. In the 1800s, it was ancestral property owned by the Teat family. It was a huge amount of property and actually had its own zip code. In other words, it wasn't located in any town. It was its own town. Of course, over time, pieces of the property were sold off and the part where the track was located became Willow Springs. In any event, Santa Fe Speedway, Speedway began motor racing in 1953. Of particular interest, here is they hosted motorcycle races on Wednesday nights. Wednesday night was an unusual day of the week to hold races, but Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were usually for auto racing. As the years went by, the odd Wednesday night schedule became an asset. Let me explain. The kind of motorcycle racing held at Santa Fe Speedway was called professional motorcycle flat track racing. This is an indigenous American sport developed just after 1903 when the Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Company was founded, joining the Indian Motorcycle Company, which began in 1901 in the motorcycle marketplace. With two motorcycle manufacturers vying for public attention, Racing was a natural outcome, and Indian versus Harley dirt track events became popular and developed into professional motorcycle flat track racing. The way flat track racing worked when Santa Fe Speedway hosted motorcycle racing was there were basically two kinds of participants, local level riders and national level riders. Typically, local riders who were becoming local stars would move up to the national level and start traveling across the country. Professional flat track racing is governed by the American Motorcyclist Association, or AMA. The AMA would sanction both local events and national events. The national events required much larger purses, anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000. Local event purses were either $1,200 or $1,500. The Santa Fe short track events had a $1,200 purse, but once a year they held a short track national with a $25,000 purse. Of course, the Santa Fe Short Track National drew every top rider in the country. First, because of the money that could be won, and second, and sometimes more important, points. Every year, the national level riders were competing all over the country to earn the most overall points to win the season championship. Among other things, this gave the national champion the honor of carrying the number one number plate the following season. Being national number one is a big deal and placed a racer in rare company. Very few have ever earned this title. Let's take a moment to meet some national number ones. It's a big deal in the flat track motorcycle racing community. This is Joe Leonard. He was national number one in 1954, 1956, and 1957. 
you might be interested to know, Joe went on to be the USAC IndyCar champion in 1971 and 1972 after he left motorcycle racing. He is the only person to ever win the national championship on two wheels and four wheels. Ah, Brad Andrews won the Flat Track Motorcycle National Championship and carried the number one plate in 1955. Some consider Carol Ressweber the greatest flat tracker of all time. He was national number one in 1958, 1959, 1960, and 1961. That's right, four-time national champion. He was famous for his full lock sliding riding style fans still talk about today. Unfortunately, he was a little before my time in flat track racing. I never saw him ride. After Carroll, it was Bad Bart Markle. He was the national number one in 1962, 1965, and 1966. Bart Markle was famous for his bad boy AMA reputation. Many from that period said AMA trouble kept him from winning another national championship. Again, just a little before my time, but reported to be a great rider nonetheless. Factory BSA mounted Dick Mann won the number one plate in 1963 and 1971. Dick was perhaps the most versatile of all motorcycle flat track racers and was first among professionals to promote and compete in motocross in the United States. Motocross was brand new in America back then, and Dick helped pioneer it in this country. He was also featured in the movie On Any Sunday. I should also mention Dick Mann was quite an engineer, and most credit him for modern flat track motorcycle racing frame geometry. He was such a good innovator, the Spanish OSA motorcycle factory hired him to develop the OSA Dick Mann replica, or DMR. This was their most successful flat track bike. In 1967 and 1968, it was factory triumph rider Gary Nixon carrying the national number one plate. The movie, considered by many to be the bible of motorcycle racing on any Sunday, introduced Mert Lawwell to the movie going public. He was one of the factory Harley riders and national number one in 1969. He was the featured motorcycle racing star in the film. Oh, speaking of films, Gene Romero carried the number one plate in 1970. He was considered movie star handsome and featured in a number of films and rode a Triumph motorcycle for the Triumph factory. Then it was factory Harley mounted Mark Brelsford in 1972. I was so proud when I out qualified him at Santa Fe Speedway one night. <laughs> no, I wasn't as fast as the national champ. I knew better. But when I saw the Brelsford team loading their equipment up for the night due to mechanical problems, my story became the night I put Brelsford on the trailer. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but I did say it. Then it was the incomparable factory Yamaha rider, Kenny Roberts. He was national number one in 1973 and 1974, after which Yamaha pulled their talented dirt track rider and sent him off to road race in Europe, where he won multiple world championships. In America, it was back to the factory Harley Davidson team. Gary Scott in 1975, and the incredible Springer, that's Jay Springsteen, in 1976, 1977, and 1978. <clears throat> you get the idea. There is only one guy who carries the number one plate every year, and that puts them in very rare company. No one gets it because some bureaucrat assigns the number to him. One has to earn it by accumulating more points than any other rider in the nation the season before. It's a huge honor requiring equal parts of talent, hard work, and yes, bravery. The point I want to make about this is every one of these guys raced at Santa Fe Speedway multiple times. But I'm sure you didn't know it because everybody doesn't get to use America's most powerful, most persuasive, most pervasive communications medium, network television. It's available only to a privileged few. You missed some great stories about some incredibly talented achievers who performed only a stone's throw away from downtown Chicago. Network television's omission of motorsport finally killed Santa Fe Speedway in 1995 after 42 years of car and motorcycle racing. We will never see its like again. I could go on and on about the people and things you should have known, but motorsport's omission from television network sports news prevented it. Oh, not just motorcycle racing. Auto racing, boat racing, snowmobile racing, airplane racing, you know, motorsports. I could have easily told similar stories about the competition at any of the Chicago area tracks, from Raceway Park to O'Hare Stadium to, well, you know, you get the idea. I guess it doesn't make any difference anymore because they are all gone. Network television killed them all. 
Still, the memories are strong for those of us who raced at these facilities. I personally raced against the last eight national champions I mentioned. Mann, Nixon, Lawwell, Romero, Brelsford, Roberts, Scott, Springsteen. Uh, <laughs> saying I raced against them is probably an overstatement. Yes, we were on the same track at the same time, but these were great national champions from all over the country and I was a local rider. The AMA rules at the time threw us all together at short tracks, and I can tell you it was a treat to see up close and personal the rare talent these guys possessed. Too bad you didn't get to see it the way I did, or at all. Putting the local rider versus national rider thing aside for a moment and returning to the importance of Santa Fe Speedway's odd Wednesday schedule. Because Santa Fe Speedway was a weekly event and the only professional flat track motorcycle racing program in the country held on Wednesday night, it was a pretty good way for national level riders to pick up some extra money if they were in the area. Of course, national riders crisscrossed the country racing national events from California to New York. There were also a number of nationals in the Midwest like Peoria and Springfield, Illinois, not to mention the Santa Fe Speedway Short Track National and the Santa Fe Speedway TT National. The nationals were always held on weekends and Wednesday nights were always open if the national riders were in the area, which was often. Local level riders raced Santa Fe every Wednesday night and would then travel to larger Midwest tracks on the weekends. Tracks like Henderson, Kentucky, Lima, Ohio, uh, Wabash, Indiana, etc. The point of telling you all this is so you will understand why Santa Fe Speedway was so important. On most Wednesday nights, there were always a large number of local level riders as you might expect. And because of the Wednesday schedule, a sizable number of national level riders, typically, there were about 150 riders signed in to attempt to qualify for the Wednesday night program. Qualifying usually eliminated a number of competitors, then heat races and semis reduced the number even further. Typically, the main event to determine the best that night was down to about 20 riders. Very seldom, if ever, was the main event won by a local level rider. The touring professional or national riders were just too good. Not to mention, many had factory support ensuring superior equipment. The bad news for the local level riders was it was nearly impossible to even think about winning or even being competitive in the main event. The good news was Santa Fe Speedway was an excellent opportunity to test yourself against the best riders in the country, indeed the world, because professional motorcycle flat track racing only takes place in the United States. As I said, it's an indigenous American sport. I personally raced against Jay Springsteen, Gary Scott, Mert Lawwell of On Any Sunday fame, even Barry Briggs, the Speedway star from England, oh, and the incomparable Kenny Roberts. This kind of opportunity only existed at Santa Fe Speedway because they raced on Wednesday nights. It was widely known in motorcycle racing circles that Santa Fe Speedway was the toughest track in the country because of substantial national level rider participation. By the way, because of this reputation, many local riders didn't even try Santa Fe. Even the local level guys at Santa Fe were fast. Basically, if you raced at Santa Fe, you were good. And if you weren't outstanding, you never got past the heat races if you qualified at all. It was that tough. I suppose one might wonder why so many of us local guys would beat our heads against the wall and keep going to Santa Fe. There was literally no chance to ever win the main event or even make the main event. I think the best answer would be to take on the challenge. <laughs> and I suppose that's part of it. But the truth is, I always thought I had a chance. And I'm guessing everyone else felt the same way. The wisdom you're hearing here today is a 74-year-old man looking back and wondering what the heck I was thinking. Oh, oh I, I knew what I was thinking. If I could just get the right engine, or the right frame, or the right tire, yep, we were always just a couple of horsepower away, and every once in a while you would get just a little bigger bite of the carrot to keep you going. Prior to the 1972 season, I bought a short track ready Boltaco engine from Mike Kidd out of Texas. 
For those who don't know, Boltaco was a Spanish motorcycle company that made mostly racing motorcycles. Mike Kidd was a top-notch touring pro and an outstanding short track rider. He operated out of Texas and had gotten a Boltaco factory ride, thus his team didn't need the engine they already prepared for the 1972 season. After getting the engine and checking it out, I was surprised to find it wasn't as radical as what I had been building. Still, my kid was as good as they came at Santa Fe and I wanted to try it. I installed it in my Champion Frame Short Tracker and was really surprised at how well it worked at Santa Fe. It wasn't really more powerful than what I'd been building, but it just worked at Santa Fe. It was a good education for me. It's not just about power. It was about having the right power characteristics and the Mike Kidd engine worked. 1972 was probably my best year at Santa Fe. Of course, there is a reason I'm mentioning 1972. While it was true, I was a local level rider, not a national quality rider, I did win my share of B program main events. I won't bore you with the details of the B program at Santa Fe except to say the A program was the fastest qualifying 21 riders of that night. The remaining 100 plus riders ran the B program. Now, the reason I've gone through explaining all of this Santa Fe motorcycle racing stuff is so you'll understand how thrilled I was when the announcer included my name when reading the end of season awards like track champion, track record holder, etc. I only heard my name, number 43P, Billy Wold from Franklin Park, Illinois and I wasn't quite sure why he said it. I was up in the stands as many of the local riders did during intermission. My wife and friends were all excited and congratulating me. What, what did he say? What was that about? I didn't quite hear it, but I, I heard my name. A couple of other riders who were going back to the pits stopped. Congratulations, Bill. Then my Chris, you won, you won. My wife was elated. I won what? What did I win? You're the most improved rider of the year. Really? Are you sure? I knew what it was. It was sort of an award for an outstanding local rider. I suppose the powers that be, knowing in a crowd of national caliber riders, the local guys don't have much of a chance at traditional track championships. I guess it was recognition for outstanding performance in very deep water. I knew the names of previous winners and they were all fast. I was indeed flattered to be considered part of that group. It's really a shame I should have to explain all this so you'll understand the significance of the word, the award. On at least a dozen occasions, I was the 22nd fastest qualifier, and on numerous occasions, I was 23rd, 24th, 25th out of 150 riders. Always one of the top five in the B program, just missing the 21 fastest. Not a big deal? Yes, it was. And if you know the whole Santa Fe story, you would know that made me one of the top 25 motorcycle racers in the nation. That's how tough Santa Fe was. And a local guy doing that well against the best our nation had to offer should have made local television sports news. But, of course, just as you knew nothing about any of the motorcycle racing that went on every Wednesday night at Santa Fe Speedway for 50 consecutive years because television failed to include it in sports news, Okay, okay, I, I know it sounds self-serving, and it is. I'm proud of what I achieved at Santa Fe Speedway, as are most of the guys who raced there, because we knew how tough it was. I tell the story because sometimes a personal story of being ignored has greater impact. In case it didn't, let me try another. I mentioned I personally raced against Kenny Roberts at Santa Fe Speedway. Big deal, right? Who's Kenny Roberts? Again, you don't know because television was far too busy with Cubs, Bears, White Sox, et al. Let me tell you who Kenny Roberts was and is. Roberts, a California rider, may well have been the most talented motorcycle racer who ever existed. Just a few of his highlights, including winning the national championship in 1973 and 1974 while riding an underpowered Yamaha against the all-conquering Harley-Davidson factory wrecking crew out of Milwaukee. Knowing they didn't have a competitive dirt track machine, Yamaha decided to send its sensational young star to Europe to try road racing, a kind of racing at which Yamaha machines excelled. The only thing was, road racing at the time was considered a European thing. Americans, by and large, just didn't do it. Europeans had a rich and storied road racing history with superstars like John Surtees and Mike Hawthorne and Giacomo Agostini. 
Europeans didn't think much of this American dirt track rider going over to Europe to participate in world championship road racing. Except Kenny won the world championship his first year in Europe flaunting his two-wheel sideways sliding style most Europeans criticized. But then he won the world championship again the next year. Europeans started emulating his riding style. Then the third year, he won the world championship again. By this time, his wild flamboyant riding style had totally changed motorcycle road racing riding style in Europe, and his success brought a slew of Americans to Europe. It would be a long time before a European won the world championship again. Even with all that, winning two national championships, winning three world championships, changing the style of road racing in Europe forever, the most famous Kenny Roberts ride happened right here in the United States at the Indianapolis Dirt Track Mile in 1975. Look it up on the internet, Kenny Roberts 1975 Indy Mile. It's pretty awesome stuff. He was special and he raced at Santa Fe Speedway a number of times. It's too bad you didn't know about any of this at Santa Fe Speedway because television ignored motorsport while fawning over some pitcher with a sore elbow or running back with a bothersome hamstring. They sure kept you informed about that. Gee, if you only knew, you could have seen Kenny Roberts in action at Santa Fe Speedway for a $10 ticket. If you only knew. It's too bad we don't have a communications medium with words and pictures that includes everyone. You miss so much. The point of my personal story, as well as the King Kenny Roberts, as he was known at the time story, is so you understand motorsport has as much human drama as any of the competitors in the sports entertainment marketplace. You just don't know about them. Believe me, those were just a small taste of the human drama in history that is part of motorsport. Our omission from television sports news didn't just hurt us, it hurt you too. As long as we allow television to dominate the public consciousness without living up to their responsibilities, we are all victims. We only know what they allow us to know. You know, writing this stuff is usually easy for me because I've been screaming about these things for more than 30 years. Sometimes, though, I find myself in need of clarifying because circumstances have changed. That doesn't mean the issues I've been championing have changed. It just means I have to remind viewers not to be deceived by fancy trinkets or shiny objects. My argument for fair representation on the public airwaves remains unchanged. However, I find it necessary to say, once again, everything with a cathode ray tube or an LED screen is not the television of which I'm speaking. I was reminded of the need to repeat this the other day when I was explaining my case against network television and the omission of motorsport from news programs. I was asked if I'd ever heard of the internet and the fact that anyone who wants to be presented on television has the opportunity. If you've been thinking that, you know, that I didn't know about the internet, then you haven't been listening closely enough or I haven't repeated it enough. The internet is a wonderful thing and I would like to think this is what network television will eventually look like. As long as everyone has access, I'm fine with it. And the good thing about the internet is everyone can do it, at least for now. And that fact makes it useless for the purpose of influencing the public. The fact that everyone can do it removes its exclusiveness and its power. The object of my concerns isn't failure to have motorsport images on cathode ray tubes and LED screens. It's the failure to have the motorsport community be part of the public consciousness that is dictated by network television. I don't see network television abandoning their domination of the public consciousness and happily occupying the internet instead of the public airwaves anytime soon. So our demand for inclusion remains the same, regardless of a readily available internet or open space on a security camera system for that matter. You see, it isn't about who's on television, it's about who's watching. It's about what is influencing the public and network television still has a stranglehold on that. In a way, it's a little like people reminding me that Motorsports Unlimited has been on public access cable television for 30 years and asking why I'm not satisfied with that television presence. It's because public access cable television has no power. That doesn't mean it's nothing. That's not true either. 
but compared to network television, it is nothing. I explained before, freedom of speech is a comparative thing. The freedom to sit in a locked closet and say anything you want isn't much of a freedom, especially when others get to stand on a soapbox in the public square and speak. Both have the freedom to speak, but one has the power to influence, the other doesn't. Similarly, having an opportunity to express myself on cable access television is sort of freedom of speech, but like sitting in a locked closet and expressing yourself, it has no power. Especially when those you compete with for public attention are allowed to express themselves without the closet walls and locked door. As I explained before, I didn't expect our little public access cable television series Motorsports Unlimited would solve our problem of the motorsport community not being able to be part of the public consciousness, except at a very local level. Our problem is national. On the other hand, I hoped someone with real resources would hear of our work because it would be on cable, which was certainly better than a locked closet and step forward to lend significant financial help because in the end, I've always been convinced this issue would have to end up in front of the Supreme Court and that takes real money. Oh, I'll admit I had some thought that in the meantime, if we had serious financial support, we might be able to make something out of public access cable television. What I mean is, Chris and I worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week, producing and distributing Motorsports Unlimited, and it was working, locally to be sure, but it was working. People were watching and using the word motorsport, so they were listening too. I mentioned earlier I had tangible evidence people were watching. Perhaps the best evidence was from network television, a piece CBS News did about Motorsports Unlimited. There are a few limits to what TV producers will try these days to get people to watch. But in Schaefer's place, Mark reports on a show done right here in Chicago that uses an old-fashioned gimmick to draw a crowd of viewers. Yeah, you bring it over. Now, At a cable TV studio downtown Chicago, they're getting ready to shoot a segment of Motorsports Unlimited, arguably the most watched cable TV show in Chicago. Hi, I'm Subi Etzenthaler. Appearing on nine cable systems in the area, I'm Denise, and welcome to... On most Sports systems, it's seen four times a week no, well, with such blockbuster topics as new advances in fuel injection technology mm -hmm. and the advantages of a stroked crank 484 with steel lifters. Hi, I'm Chris Schutz. The reason this motorsport show is so popular is the star. I'm Bill Wilt, and we want to welcome you to Motorsports Unlimited. This cable TV show features muscle cars and mannequins, live ones, and they are what everyone's watching. You're the guy that has that show with those girls with the feathers. They don't know his name or the name of the show, but they recognize the feathers. That's right. Instantly. So it's kind of like you are the stars, in a way. Sure. Listen, this is a great car, but I'm going to tell you something. We're going to have to move. We're going to have to walk around behind the uh, car, and I'll explain it as we go. Just go ahead and walk around there. See, I get uh, angry letters from viewers if we block the girls. So <laughs> Often interviews are done way in the back of the studio while the cameras get shots of the cars from interesting angles. And they sometimes stay on those shots for a long time. They certainly do. It's campy, it's dated, it's unbelievable, and it's absolutely mesmerizing. The hour-long show is a low-budget cable access production. Everyone's a volunteer. Bill, the star, helps in all phases of production. No detail escapes his attention. Or should that be, no important detail escapes his attention. How can I get folks to watch our little public access show when they all have a remote control in their hand and they can go to Channel 2 like that? Nothing attracts attention like a pretty girl. Motorsports Unlimited is a show that knows its audience. Is it rolling? Okay. Girls, arch your backs, puff up, big warm smiles. Everybody look at camera two, big smile. Mark Schaefer, Channel 2 News. Just as long as it's not on at 10 o'clock at night. Good night, see you at 8. Even though that piece aired more than 25 years ago, I still remember it fondly. The CBS crew did their taping while we were recording a show in the CAC studio when it was still on Green Street in Chicago. I remember chatting with Mark and another person who I presume was the producer. You have to remember, cable was still very new to Chicago back then, and I could tell they weren't really sure what to make of it. Or us. I was trying to explain we were a public access show, but I'm not sure they completely understood, and after a few minutes, I decided I'd better shut up before I talked myself out of a good thing. 
I think they thought we were a cable show, you know, as in produced by a cable company. I just don't think they understood public access cable was just regular people trying to get a message out. In any event, I was very pleased with what they did. I expected that they would make fun of us a little bit, but it wasn't bad, and I get, we look different than what people were used to seeing on television. <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> One thing was sure, we were being noticed and people were talking about us and using the word motorsport or CBS wouldn't have been there. And that's the point I'm trying to make now. There was no reason we couldn't do what we were doing in the Chicago area that commanded some network television attention all over the country. The problem was that takes resources, money. While Chris and I were willing to work free, one couldn't expect people around the country to take care of organizing and distribution of a local public access cable show in their area without compensation. It's a ton of work and one has to stay on top of it all the time. We were doing well in the Chicago area as far as attracting an audience and getting people talking about motorsport, but to travel to other parts of the country and recruit people to develop a network to get motorsports and limited scene around the country would require many more hours, not to mention money, than we had. It was a thought and I kept the thought in my back pocket in case someone approached me about what it would take to expand motorsports unlimited. But it was only a thought and never went anywhere as money just wasn't available. Money. <laughs> it's been a thorn in my side uh, since the beginning of Motorsports Unlimited. I suppose that's where I should take the conversation next. I've already touched on my battles with the cable companies and in some cases the government along with the technical challenges of learning how to produce television shows. All daunting tasks to be sure but the constant battle to keep Motorsports Unlimited viable financially was equally draining. I'd hoped to keep the program afloat with $10 and $20 donations. You see, as Chris and I quickly found out, public access television was proving to be the most expensive free thing we'd ever done. Things most people don't even think about were killing us. For example, tapes. The cable industry standard at the time was three quarter inch equipment, usually Sony-U-Matic. By the way, here is a piece of Motorsports Unlimited trivia. Do you know why Motorsports Unlimited is a one hour program? It's because three quarter inch tape cassettes come in a variety of sizes, the largest being one hour. I knew from the beginning if we were going to succeed in attracting an audience, it would be people flipping through the channels. Given this reality, I wanted Motorsports Unlimited to be on the air as long as possible so we might have a better chance of people finding us while we were on the air. So. I went for the longest tape available. I suppose I could have made it a two hour program, but the, that wouldn't really be convenient for the cable operator, you know, having to queue up two separate tapes to play consecutively, and it would have been a recipe for disaster. Oh yes, it would also require two one hour tapes per show, and at $20 each, it was out of the question. Yes, that's right, a one hour, three quarter inch tape costs $20. They come 10 in a case, which means $200 per case. Yes, you can buy them onesie twosie, but the cost is higher, as high as $25 each. Of course, the one hour tape is only good for the program master and program dubs. The one hour cassettes does not physically fit in the portable equipment. The longest tape that will fit in the portable equipment is a 20 minute cassette. They sell for $16 per tape, as long as you buy them by the case of 10. That means $160 per case of 10 20 minute tapes. Typically, a trip to the tape company was a $360 outlay. One case of 60 minute tapes and one case of 20 minute tapes. It still hurts me to think about it. It wasn't just tapes. Without question, one of the biggest outlays was feeding the crew and the girls. Motorsports Unlimited is a one hour program, but it sure takes more than an hour to tape it. Shooting at Great Lakes Dragway is a good example and we shot many programs there. We would usually arrive there at about noon and leave after midnight. After having the crew out there all day, we had to at least feed them. We often stopped at Bob's Big Boy on the way home. Depending on the number of people I had with me, you know, a cameraman, an audio man, three to five girls, and me, the bill at Bob's would usually be around $150. As I said before, Chris and I often commented on public access cable television being the most expensive free thing we ever did. That, along with wishing I was independently wealthy, was a common theme of discussion in our home. For the first two years, I was paying for everything myself, but the situation was becoming desperate. You see, television is a jealous mistress. It doesn't allow one to do anything else. For example, editing, the heart of television production. The rule of thumb in television is for every minute on the air, there's an hour in the edit suite. 
Motorsports Unlimited is a 60 minute show, thus 60 hours editing. It actually turns out that the rule of thumb is just about right. Motorsports Unlimited always averaged between 40 and 60 hours per episode to edit. Obviously, between shooting, editing, and distributing Motorsports Unlimited, there wasn't much time to do any side jobs. I really had to figure out a way to generate revenue to pay for this effort. My first thought was to appeal for funds on a program. The only problem was one can't do that on public access television. It's one of the prohibitions. What sounded reasonable at the beginning, you know, no advertising, no gambling, no fundraising, was proving to be something of a catch-22. Yes, the equipment was free. Yes, the lessons were free. And yes, they air whatever you produce for free as long as there is no advertising, gambling, or fundraising, except, as it turns out, there is a whole lot more that costs money to television production. So what now? Here we had the opportunity to get the motorsport community on television, at least locally, but the financial reality was taking it out of reach. Finances were at a critical level. Of course, I have marketable skills, but they all take time away from doing the show. And I was convinced one of the important competitive advantages we had was producing a new show every week. It occurred to me I needed a persuasive appeal for funding that wasn't quite an appeal for funding. You know, something that would meet the technical requirements of no fundraising, but still get my point across. Before we went belly up, I thought it was worth a try anyway. I wrote it very carefully, avoiding a blatant appeal for funding. It is painful doing something like this. I hate fundraising when I'm the object of the effort, and as it turns out, I hate it even more when I'm doing it. Anyway, it took a few weeks until I felt I had it just right. This isn't exactly easy. The piece had to be long enough for people to have time to write down the address and phone number, but not so long as to be ponderous. Decisions, decisions. Once again, I curse not being financially independently wealthy, <laughs> but it is what it is, and I did produce something I felt walked the line of acceptability and might be effective. I'm going to show it to you, but don't pay any attention to the address or phone number. This piece was produced more than 25 years ago, and everything has changed since, but uh, take a look. Motorsport Advancement Crusade is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and enhancement of motorsport. We are entirely funded by voluntary contributions. For more information, write Motorsport, or you can write the whole name, Motorsport Advancement Crusade, if you want. But mail gets to us just fine addressed, Motorsport, P.O. Box 66242, Chicago, Illinois, 60666. Or just call area code 312 678 3577. We enjoy hearing from our audience and encourage you to call or write. Not bad, huh? I thought it was pretty good. Actually, one of the cable companies on which Motorsports Unlimited aired at the time, and, and still do, thought it was too good and told me they wouldn't air it because I was soliciting funds. To which I responded, well, I hope you checked it out with your legal department because I am definitely not soliciting funds. To which they said, well, you're pretty close, to which I said, again, you might want to check with your legal department about how pretty close holds up in court, because that's where we're heading. They apparently had a change of heart, because by the time I got home from my tape deliveries, there was a message from them asking if I would mind bringing the tape back, which I did, and they aired it as they should have, and I had no further difficulties airing the piece. <laughs> it's funny, as I look back today, it was so important at the time. That piece aired for about 10 years, and in all that time, it yielded less than $100. If they thought I was going to get rich from it, they had nothing to worry about. Of course, I realized within a year or so that it wasn't going to work. In fact, the post office box I had to buy to put a mailing address on the screen cost me more than it brought in, significantly more. I probably shouldn't say this because I'm not religious, but I was actually starting to feel sympathy for the TV printers, uh, preachers who seem to spend most of their time begging. Now I knew why. People don't respond, or at least they don't reach in their pockets and give. And the churches, like everyone else, has bills to pay. Light bills, gas bills, etc. It was an interesting lesson. Interesting though it may have been, I knew I still had to solve the problem, or the show couldn't continue. Not to mention, there was a chance I could lose my home. The situation was that critical. I looked around to figure out how others were doing what I was trying to do. As it turns out, there is a way. Lo and behold, it's in the tax code of all things.
There are several categories of organizations and entities created for purposes other than profit. The most important one, and the one everybody wants, is called 501c3. It was something I hadn't really heard of before. Oh, I, I'd heard of it, but it didn't really mean anything to me. My life was about developing technical ideas to win races, not schemes to separate folks from their money. Now, let me say in advance, I am not a lawyer, and yet I'm going to be talking about law. My reasoning is simple. We are all required to obey the law, not just lawyers. If we get to the point where only lawyers have to obey the law, then I'll stop talking about it. It seems to me it's appropriate for all of us to comment on and participate in lawmaking, especially when the content of the laws in question affect us so dramatically. I'm not providing legal advice, but I feel quite comfortable explaining what I've learned and talking about as best I can the laws that have such enormous influence on our lives. As I looked into it, this 501c3 thing made sense. It seems the government was looking for a way to encourage activities that aren't likely to be pursued by people looking to make money, as is the normal objective in a capitalist society. Things like scientific research, or schools, or medical researchers, churches of course. I've forgotten some of it now, come on, it was almost 30 years ago and a subject in which I have very little interest. I remember the gist of it though. The idea is some things need to be pursued for the good of society, but are unlikely to generate revenue. Thus, a f thus very few would or could devote themselves to it. For example, someone doing cancer research work. It may take generations to find a solution, if ever. Yet we want people to keep pursuing a solution, and to do it, they need funding. So how do they get that funding? No one is going to invest in something for which they don't see an eventual return on investment. So how does society ensure cancer research continues? The same could be said for education. Who is going to or could set up a school to pass on knowledge without funding? Schools don't have a product. They don't manufacture something one can sell for profit. So who is going to teach the next generation to read and write? The answer is 501c3. When an institution is a 501c3 organization, they have some tax uh, advantages. First, they don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> not really a big deal when you are not manufacturing or selling a product. If you don't make any money, you don't have to worry about taxes. But there is more. Not only don't they pay taxes, people or organizations who contribute to 501c3 organizations get to deduct that do donation from their taxes. Let me repeat that. <clears throat> it doesn't sound important, but as it turns out, it is. People or organizations who contribute to 501c3 organizations get to deduct it from their taxes. Sort of a so what for most of us. I don't think I know anybody in a position to worry about finding a place to donate money that would otherwise go to the government. Everybody I know is usually concerned about whether they listed enough uh, dependents so adequate taxes are taken from their checks so they don't have to pay at the end of the year. You know what I'm talking about. It's always hold your breath time every year when you sit down with a tax guy to do your taxes. Well, it's a whole different world for the wealthy and super wealthy, and we're going to talk about it a little bit because the more I dug into it, the more I realized how much it was hurting the motorsport community. Let me say this in advance. I'm certainly no tax expert, nor do I have any interest in the subject. I can tell you this. When I was looking into it almost 30 years ago, it was some of the most boring reading I've ever done, <laughs> and I like to read. The only reason I continued was because it was so revealing and another piece of the puzzle of what was happening to the motorsport community. Let's see if I can explain briefly. <laughs> Yeah, briefly is the hard part. Tax law in writing is hundreds of volumes and, in my view, deliberately overly complex, even deceptive. Unfortunately, it's also important. As Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall once pointed out, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Oh yes, 501c3, the golden goose. Despite the way most of us live, there are people who have hundreds of millions of dollars of tax obligation. Those who earn billions, and these folks do indeed look for places to put their money rather than give it to the government. First, 
because the 501c3 they are giving to might be something in which they are genuinely interested in support. Second, because often the government will offer incentives to invest in something the government thinks is important and needs to be funded. But there is no way to get it funded through the traditional legislative process. For example, let's say the government uh, sees a need for low-income housing in a certain area, but the political winds don't favor the possibility. So, another way of doing it is to offer a tax shelter. I hope I'm using that term correctly. If someone is willing to donate $150 million to the 501c3 low-income housing project, they are allowed to, say for the purpose of this discussion, they allow, they're allowed a $175 million tax deduction. So they give $150 million and they get to deduct $175 million. It's a $25 million incentive to put money into the low-income housing project in question. So what does that have to do with motorsport, right? Listen further. You know what? This 501c3 thing is important and has a significant influence on our lives. We really don't have enough time left to explain in an uninterrupted form. So let's save it for the beginning of the next episode. If you've been watching these explanation shows, you know John Platania has been bugging me for more action footage. You know, so you'll know you're watching Motorsports Unlimited. <laughs> Certainly, I agree. It's just that I get involved in explaining Motorsports Unlimited and its purpose and somehow all the time is gone. This time, I'm not going to allow myself to get into a lengthy explanation of 501c3 and use up all the time again. Although, we might, we might have enough. No, I'm not going to do it again. It's time for some classic Motorsports Unlimited action footage. That's it for this week on Motorsports Unlimited. Right now, we're done. With only enough time to thank my friend John Platania for helping in the studio, and I hope I left room for more than a few seconds of action footage and John is happy. Me, I'm Bill Wilt. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time when I try to make sense out of 501c3. <laughs> I know, it sounds like a yawn, and it is, but it's really important. We have to talk about it. This program made possible in part by support from ABC Auto Parts, located on Ashland Avenue at 138th Street in Blue Island, Illinois. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from Jimmy's Red Hots, located on Grand Avenue and Pulaski Road in Chicago. Motorsports Unlimited was created to raise public consciousness understanding and appreciation of the motorsport community and their activities. You can contact us by email at msutv.com or email us directly at msutv at aol.com. We enjoy hearing from our audience and encourage you to let us know what you think. So that's it, another edition of Motorsports Unlimited and the lovely ladies of motorsports. And be with us next week because we'll have something real exciting. Bill Wilt's going to have the lovely ladies and just about anything can happen right here on Motorsports Unlimited. Every week at this time, we bring you the best in motorsports. So uh, be seeing you. Bye-bye. And uh, keep on rocking.